In 1510 CE, the Portuguese Empire, as part of its ambitious plan to dominate Indian Ocean trade, conquered the province of Goa from the Bijapur Sultanate. Goa was made the capital of Portuguese India. Though they were initially welcomed by the native population, the Portuguese quickly showed the natives just how foolish they were to trust them. In 1560 CE, the Portuguese brought their Catholic Inquisition all the way to Goa. In doing so, the Portuguese sought to establish a Catholic stronghold in Asia, where religious laws would be strictly enforced. Both natives and Portuguese settlers were subject to extreme punishment, loss of property, imprisonment, torture, and even death by immolation. The Goan Inquisition created a persecution hell. As Voltaire once remarked, Goa is famous for its Inquisition, equally contrary to humanity and commerce. The Portuguese monks made us believe that the people worshipped the devil, but it is the monks themselves who have served him. In 1492 CE, Spain expelled all Muslims and Jews who refused to convert to Christianity. Many tens of thousands of religious minorities fled to Portugal for safety, but soon the Portuguese also began to adopt discriminatory ideas. And so in 1497 CE, the King of Portugal, Manuel I, ordered that all Muslims and Jews be forcibly converted to Christianity. Converts came to be known as New Christians. New Christians comprised an identifiable social class distinct from normal Christians. The New Christians were subject to violence and discrimination. Pious normal Christians simply didn't trust the New Christians, who were believed to practice their old religions in secret. Unsurprisingly, when the Portuguese Empire established a colony at Goa in 1510 CE, many New Christians fled for India, hoping to escape persecution. Goa was especially attractive for New Christians of Jewish heritage, as there were long-standing Jewish communities in South India. For example, the Malabari Jews living in Kerala. This allowed Portuguese New Christians to rediscover their Jewish faith. Back in Portugal, a much harsher approach was adopted after the formal establishment of the Inquisition in 1536 CE, with the approval of the Pope. Notably, this Inquisition only applied to Portugal, not to any foreign colonies. The Portuguese Inquisition became a theocratic arm of the state, subject to the authority of the king. It was headed by a Grand Inquisitor, named by the Pope, but selected by the king, and always from within the royal family. The Grand Inquisitor would then later nominate other Inquisitors. Finally, courts of the Inquisition were set up throughout Portugal. Though tasked with defending the integrity of the faith, examining false doctrines, and forbidding heresy against Catholic Christianity, the Inquisition also served a political function. It censored books, attacked political dissidents, banned non-standard cultural practices, and more. In its initial few decades, the Portuguese administration in Goa was relatively open-minded. It was helmed by adventurous, worldly men who relied on new Christians and natives for assistance. Life was cosmopolitan. Portuguese settlers were encouraged to marry native women. The city of Goa had a vibrant Jewish street, and early Portuguese missionaries made efforts to learn the local language, Konkani. Goa changed in the coming decades as the number of religiosos, clergymen and missionaries, grew. The religiosos soon became a significant force in Portuguese India. The royalty backed their extremist religious views and began to take steps to impose those views, even before a formal inquisition had been established in Goa. First, the Portuguese administration started to offer financial incentives for converting Hindus and Muslims over to Catholicism. Then, in 1546 CE, the Portuguese king also issued an order destroying all Hindu temples in Portuguese Indian lands. By 1569 CE, a royal letter acknowledged that all Hindu temples in Goa had been demolished outright. Records indicate that well over 760 temples in Goa alone were razed to the ground. Policies regarding Indian Muslims were also oppressive. Though mosques were not outright destroyed in the pre-Inquisition era, a heavy tax was levied to ensure that they would be incapable of normal operation. The Goan Inquisition was jump-started in 1543 CE with the arrival of St. Francis Xavier, co-founder of the Jesuits. According to St. Francis, Portuguese settlers were engaged in scandalous and undisciplined behavior by adopting native customs and forming relationships with non-Christian women. And so, in 1546 CE, St. Francis, from his new base in Malacca, sent a letter to the Portuguese king, John III, requesting that an inquisition be established in Goa. St. Francis's request was finally granted in 1560 CE, and a formal inquisition was established in Goa. The Inquisition headquartered itself in the former palace of the Bijapur Sultan. The Goan Inquisition had many facets. Beyond subjecting individuals to its tribunals and judgments, it had an influence on colonial administration. 
Thus, Portuguese religious and secular infrastructure was deployed to destroy the enemies of the Inquisition. Any behavior deemed heretical was punished, and the list of heretical behaviors was broad and vaguely defined, leaving the Inquisition open to corruption. Financial incentives were given to citizens to disclose the transgressions of their family, friends, and neighbors, leading to false accusations for profit or revenge. Citizen accusers were given 50% of the property taken after a conviction, and inquisitors were given the remaining 50%. As such, there was ample reason to convict those who were not actually guilty. The Portuguese religiosos took advantage of their position to gain wealth and influence. They seized property for themselves, maintained luxury estates, and even had native concubines. The religiosos used the Goan Inquisition to remake themselves into a sort of colonial nobility. How did the Inquisition process work? Simply put, those who were accused were charged with a heretical crime and were presumed guilty. The accused had up to 40 days to confess. If they did not, then they would be subject to a trial. During trial, the inquisitorial officials could apply torture to extract confessions. Witnesses would also be brought forth to testify. After the trial was prosecuted, the convicted would be forced to undergo a punishment at the final step of the Inquisition process, the auto de fe, an hours-long event in which both religious and civil authorities were in attendance. The auto de fe was a well-orchestrated public penance of great pomp and ceremony. There would be a night of prayer and a breakfast feast, followed by a procession of prisoners. Prisoners were then taken to the quemadero, or burning place, where their punishment was read out. Those who were acquitted, or who had their punishment suspended, were expected to fall to the ground and give thanks. The remaining prisoners would be subject to a variety of punishments, depending on the severity of their supposed religious crime. Fines, public whipping, a term of imprisonment, torture, execution, and worst of all, burning the convicted prisoner alive at the stake. In Goa, Portuguese authorities feared that visiting Jews from the Malabar coast and the Middle East were causing formerly Jewish new Christians to lapse into their old faith. Certainly, many new Christians were rediscovering their old faith. Secret synagogues were established. Many new Christians practiced Judaism privately in Goa and publicly when traveling outside its borders. Fearing that foreign Jews were influencing new Christians, the Portuguese viceroy decided to ban Jews from Goa outright on December 16th 1565. Any Jews who entered Goa would have their property appropriated by the state. This action is believed to have caused an exodus of Jewish New Christians to the Malabar coast and the Middle East. As Jewish New Christians comprised a significant portion of the merchant class in Goa, these actions took a major toll on the ability of the Portuguese Empire to compete commercially. Those who remained in Goa were subject to oppression. Consider the New Christian professor Garcia de Orta who worked as a physician for the Bijapur Sultan in the mid-1500s. He discovered that his sister was burned alive at the stake in Goa for the crime of Judaizing. During her inquisition, she even confessed that her brother Garcia was also a practicing Jew in secret. But while the Goan inquisition did target Jewish New Christians and Muslims, its primary target was Hindus. After the onset of the Goan Inquisition, sweeping anti-Hindu laws were imposed by the colonial administration to expunge native culture and religion, and to incentivize conversion to Christianity. Curiously, the Portuguese didn't see the caste system as a problem. In fact, they openly embraced the caste system as an analog to social mores in Europe. This wholesale embrace of the caste system won converts from high caste elites, Brahmins and Kshatriyas. Even today, Goan Christians with Brahmin heritage refer to themselves as Bamans and can recall their original Brahmin surnames. By comparison, low caste Hindus and converts were treated harshly. Restrictions on Hinduism included the open practice of Hinduism, from ceremonies to festivals, was outlawed, and violators faced the death penalty. Hindus were forced to occasionally attend church to listen to critiques of Hinduism. Hindu priests were prohibited from entering Goa. Mere ownership of religious idols was made a criminal offense. Hindus were unacceptable as witnesses in legal proceedings, making it easy for Christians to use the courts to escape justice. Hindus were forbidden from constructing new temples or repairing damaged ones. Christians were prohibited from employing Hindus. Hindus were forbidden from participation in village assemblies in areas with Christian majorities. Hindus were not entitled to hold public office. A heavy tax known as Shendi was imposed on Hindus living in Goa. 
As if all that wasn't enough, the Portuguese implemented a system so unjust that it garnered international scrutiny. Hindu orphans were to become wards of the Jesuits and converted to Christianity. But here's the problem. The Portuguese defined an orphan as any Hindu child whose father had died. Thus, children with complete families, living with their mother, aunts, uncles, and grandparents, were declared orphans and taken away to be converted. And when one of these orphans was seized by the Jesuits, the property of the parents was seized too. Historians have even found instances where Portuguese authorities would extort money from the families for the return of these orphans. All things considered, it's really no surprise that there was a mass exodus of non-Christians out of Goa. Most Hindus and Muslims moved across the border and resettled in the Bijapur Sultanate. The Sultanate was significantly more friendly to Hindus than the Portuguese colonial government. In fact, the Bijapur Sultans were known for their amicable nature and fairness towards local Hindus and their culture. The Hindus who stayed behind were forced to suffer the many indignities of living in Portuguese Goa. But even the ones who converted to Catholic Christianity were restricted in many ways from maintaining their old customs. In fact, history records many new Christians who left Goa due to the oppression they faced even after conversion. Formerly Hindu new Christians were not allowed to maintain their native language names, and the Portuguese suppressed Konkani, Marathi, and Sanskrit so as to separate converts from their roots. Books in native languages were burned. By the end of the 1500s CE, the persecution hell created by the Portuguese religiosos had scared away much of the talent that the empire needed to maintain its position at the top of the international trade hierarchy. The loss of well-connected merchants, formerly Jewish New Christians and Hindus alike, crippled the competitive ability of the Portuguese in India. The religiosos made Goa a less attractive trade entrepot. Eventually, the Dutch were able to swoop in and establish themselves as the dominant European trading force in the subcontinent. Sadly, much of what we know about the Portuguese Inquisition in Goa has been lost due to the majority of the records having been destroyed by the Portuguese government in 1821 CE, the same year that the Inquisition was abolished, ending nearly three centuries of oppression and bloodshed. But the terror and oppression brought by the Inquisition will never be forgotten.